<laughs> hey, we're going to figure out our internet around here. So hopefully this one goes the whole service. If not, we will put the recording up later. But I will get with our internet company this week and make sure it tries to get a full service recorded. But welcome online this morning. Welcome, welcome. And if it's your first time online, um, there will be a link where you can uh, link, tell us that you're with us, and also sign up for some of the events that are going on here at Church 180. Um, you will also see an event there for tacos, Talking and Tacos, which is tonight. It's for people who are new, want to get to know our church, want to get to know people in our church. And you get to talk to everybody there, but also eat some great tacos. Yes, yes. What do we have going on? We have a worship night, right? We do. We have a worship night on Thursday, April 11th at 7 p.m. The doors will open at 6.30. Yes, at City Lights Church. It's over at East Lake. You can see online on that QR code the actual address, but it's going to be great. And also online, you can find a link to our QR code or our QR code where you can request prayer if you need prayer. There's a team of us here at 180 yes. that will pray for you. And also, lastly, uh, generosity, the things that we do here at Church 180, uh, the things that we do for our community is actually able to happen because of people that are generous in our congregation and also you. So if you want to go online, church180sd.com slash give. Yes, that's it. We always say that we believe generosity is the fuel that Jesus uses to help people turn toward hope.
kingdom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Turn. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Ready? This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise. Thankful to be in church this morning. Come on, you better be. You slept in today. You got to sleep in. Some of you, you got to sleep in and get your hair done, everything, get your nails, everything did. Hey, we're so glad you're here. So glad you are joining us for our second service, whether you're in person or watching online. We love you. Anybody thankful that God is the king of your heart this morning? Would you lift a hand? Yep, there you go, there you go. I love the second service. You guys are awake and alive. Hey, we're going to continue to worship. Is that okay with you? Can I pray for us? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. God, I thank you this morning that you are the king of our hearts, Jesus. God, I thank you that you are alive and well, and today and forever we celebrate that. Until we see you face to face, God, we're going to praise you like you're in the room because you are. Church, he's in the room today. Do you believe it? He's in this room. He's in your heart. He's, he's moving through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's in the seats. He's, he's with you. And this morning we're going to pray and believe that he is the king of our soul, the king of our heart, the king of our city, the king of our nation, the king of our country. God, we love you, we love you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. The shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, cause you are good, you're good.
and you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down p.m. or actually talking with tacos tonight for anybody who's new wants to learn more about the church and wants to talk to others about the church uh, you can get the link on the qr code and there also there's also a first and amen 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 stand to your feet yeah you can clap okay come on Anybody need God this morning? Anybody need? I don't know about you, but I, I look to the theme of sphere around this, Lord. And God, this morning, so good as a band that we would bring a little bit of heaven down to earth. God, we sang that song. This is what freedom looks like and who are worshiping you freely. So today, Lord, I pray for those hearts who came in hardened. Would you, would you just bring a, a, a fresh revival? Would you bring a fresh fire? Would you bring a fresh healing to our spirits this morning, Jesus? And would you heal our hearts and heal our land. In Jesus' name, we love you, we love you, and we love you, we need you, Lord, this morning. Amen. I have this thirst. Only you can satisfy I search and seek But you're never hard to find The more of you I see The more of you
Closed my eyes for a second and it got really full. Welcome. Jesus, I pray that you have your way over the next few minutes, that, God, we were convinced how much we need you, and that we would look to you um, for formation, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, I want to say this real quick. I didn't say this first service, which I, sh which I sh should have, but if you want to take this, everything we just did further, I mean, you also need to be at worship night on Thursday night. So hit the registration button so we can plan on you. Um, yeah, we have worship night this Thursday night. Be at City Lights Church at 7 o'clock. Doors open 6.30. It's over in East Lake, And it is going to be a great time. Kind of calibrate over some songs. And then I'm going to take like 10 minutes to share um, just some hardcore why we do what we do. Like 10 minutes real quick. So we would love to have you there. But hey, um, as I jump into this message today, um, this, is, this is me just being fully transparent. Okay? So let me just be fully transparent transparent. Got up here, um, Christmas season, we did Christmas in San Diego. I, I thought, I did my research and, and everything, looked at a bunch of different things. I've been geeking out on this, a couple different podcasts. And I got up here and I preached um, three times in a row. I talked about the history of San Diego, the history of the world, how we got to today and everything that's here and how right now we are in what is called, and you remember me using this term, and it doesn't have to do with liberal or conservative or politics or anything like that, but it's this neoliberal era that we're in is what we talked about. And I know that that's a big word and whatever. And basically, it's just the last 40 years is marked by our society literally running at the, the speed of the economy, okay? It's when we let the economy loose to make all these different decisions, and as a result of that, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but what I, what I was trying to preach is that as a result of the economy let loose and, and running rampant, it has created a specific type of person in our society and within our culture. And that you and I have been wrapped up into that um, to where we are consumers, right, first and foremost. We, we view the world through things that we can consume, whether they be products or experiences or all these things. I don't have time to go into a full recap. That's not what I'm trying to say. I preached, I preached up here for, for, for weeks talking about this thing and what this has done to us. Okay? Full disclosure. Christmas Eve, lights are, whatever, lights are out. We do our thing. Go home. And now, my kids are on Christmas break. And I got four little kids at home. That's enough, right? That's enough for anybody. And my kids are at home and they have needs. But me, being the neoliberal product that I am, I have a vision for what is going to happen for my week off between Christmas Day and, and New Year's, right? And it's, it's, it's the, the, the stuff that I've, you know, you know what I mean? And, and part of this vision is around Christmas and getting a little money and being a consumer and da 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 and having this image of what I want my house to look like. And so I've got this coffee corner, like, picked out. Like, we, Kelsey and I, we, 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 you know, do a bunch of research. We wanted to get a really, really, really nice coffee machine, but we were like, are we really going to drop that much money on a used thing? Because we can't even afford the real, you know, the, the, the new thing. So we settled on this specific coffee maker that we bought for our second time in the black edition this time. And, and before that, we were like, okay, you know what? We need to go with this coffee machine. We need a backsplash. Subway tile, gray grout, white subway tile, gray grout, with the black coffee machine tucked up against it. Oh, it just, ooh, just, it's nice. It's nice. While parenting four kids who are little and at home and have needs. Can I just say that the image that I had was accomplished 
for the backsplash. But I had, I had other plans. I had other desires, dreams, things that I would get done. And, 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 and about the third day, I'm working on this backsplash. And Kelsey and I are both having mild anxiety attacks <laughs> as we're going about it. And the, the, the thing that I'm trying to say is this, okay? Here's the thing I'm trying to say with this story. Our culture is forming us. It is. Our culture is forming us, whether it be the people that we do life with, for good or bad, uh, the, 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 whether it be our family, whether it be our friends and neighborhood, whether it be our social circles, whether it be the people that we work with, whatever, the people that we do life with are part of that and they are forming us for good or bad. Many of us in the room, that filtered square image that we look at on our phone is for into kinds of people, uh, whether it be any form of algorithm skewed towards those who profit from that algorithm, it's forming us, right? Because, you know, we, you, we don't see everything. We see the things that the powers that be want us to see, right? Like whenever we scroll and even look at news and stuff like this. And, and I would say all this flo it flows from the, the, the fact that we want an ideal flourishing life. And for me, this entails that I have a backsplash in my house with a coffee machine in front of it certain way. Um, for some of us, and I've given up on this one for at least this season, but it requires a certain car. It requires that our kids be involved in certain activities with certain friends. It requires that we have a social calendar that looks like whatever. It requires that, um, that we have a job that fulfills us in a certain way or that we go on trips to certain places that we want to go to that seem ideal or that we eat food, right? Like that's, we're, we're, like we're increasingly becoming a foodie culture, right? And I, even yesterday, I took, I, I made myself <laughs> it was wonderful. It was huge. It was full. I just got back from a run. And I took a picture of it. Like I was going to share it. And then I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be that guy. <laughs> and so I didn't share it. But I took a picture of it and, and everything. And so my point is this. All of this drives us in life. It drives our mindsets. It drives our schedules. And it drives our bank accounts. And the thing that I want to share with you today as we begin this new series and that you've seen from the bumper video is that we are not static. We're not. Like we are not right here doing this. We are moving in a direction with our lives. And, and the camera people um, in the back, the production of such a point because it screws up the online and they can't keep up with the camera. But, but, we're either moving towards being a person formed in the image of God, who God designed us to become, who he dreamed us to become, over here being formed by the people of God, the word of God, and God himself through his spirit, or we are being formed and moving in the direction of what particular flavor Southern California culture is at this particular moment in history. You get it? it we're be, like, like, I mean, 40 years ago, people weren't being formed into the same thing, but, but now we're 40 years later, right? And, and here we are, 2024, and there are certain things that look good, and there are certain things that drive our lives, and we're either being formed, we're not here, we're not neutral. We're not stuck. We're being formed in the image of God and heading this direction as the people of God, or we are being formed by what the world throws in around us and, 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 and puts in our direction. And I've shared this a few times this morning. I shared it with the 7.30 setup crew. I shared it with the 8.30 all teams huddle for first service. Shared it at 10 o'clock for our, our volunteers that, that are here. But I, I feel like it's worth saying again to, to this crew right now, is we are not a legalistic church. We are just, we are not. Like we, if we ever become a legalistic church, you can. I'm just kidding. Do not slap me in the face. We just will not become legalistic. There's a reason that, uh, you know, I was, I'm going to is that right now you are living out with the people of God and the word of God being opened, you are about to leave this place 167 hours 
in other contexts before you come back to this context. And our dream, like that's not my dream, God's dream and God's design is we're going to talk about from the book of Acts and the book of Daniel, all these different things. Uh, the, 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 the thing is that do not underestimate what God can do in this hour through his people and through his word to start to move you into this direction or at least to influence the other 167 hours in your week towards this direction. Because here's the thing I'm trying to say, and I'm going to say it over and over and over again today, but it's th this is easy. This is work. And so it's easy for the next 167 hours to just do life with the people that you do life with and do your job and do your work and do your, you know, social activities and do your little things and go, you know, here and go there. And it's easy to just be like, look, to look like another Southern California person. It's hard to be somebody who lives in South San Diego and be God, as we're going to talk about. That, that, that requires something. That's harder work. When it comes to this, so we've we've titled this passage, um, we've titled this uh, this play. Because you get the imagery right, like I, I know I'm, I geek out on history, but pre-industrial revolution, we, we used to have these. Th well, I guess we still do, but it's more of like a craft and a hobby now than a need or necessity. But pre-industrial revolution, we used to have these things called pottery wheels. And they would put a piece of clay up on a wheel that would spin around and people would shape that thing into our formed and molded into an image of something that could be used as a tool to provide us nourishment in, in, in so many ways. And, and so the biblical writers, they capitalize on that. And so there are many scriptures that's in your note sheet if you picked one up. Job chapter 10, Isaiah chapter 29, Isaiah chapter 45, my Favorite, Isaiah chapter 64, which was in the bumper video, Jeremiah chapter 18, Romans chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, all of these use this imagery of human beings being like clay and God himself being like the potter who has the ability to shape us and to form us into the people that he desires for us to be. So the thing that I've suggested is that we have two options. We're either being formed into the image already, but I just want to I I just want to stamp this home and highlight this, is that if you grab the note sheet, you would see that we titled this message a rule of life. And we're going to get into that in a minute and what that means. Um, but I would take it for, if, like that was on Wednesday. As, as this message sat with me on Thursday and Friday, I, I started to think, man, I mistitled this thing. <laughs> because... More than a rule of life, your rule of life is, is a weapon that, that you have. Because make no mistake at all. If you the thing you do, 1030, right? You made it to church, second service. You made it to church 180 today. And I hope you've occupied a seat this morning. And you're here in this room. I'm going to your desire this way and not this way. Can, we, can I just assume that? Like your desire, like if you wanted to go this way in your life, why are you here? <laughs> but I'm, I'm assuming that because you're here, you want to go this way with your life. And you want Jesus to get a hold of it and to form you into a certain type of person that he desires for you to be, right? And, and so with that assumption in mind, what I'm trying to say is this small stuff. This is not like, I'm just going to go that way. I'm going to be formed by Jesus this week. This is the fight of your life. And the rule is the weapon that you have to get it's the gloves, right? This is a 12 round knockout, <laughs> drag out fight of your life to go this direction. And the, the, the tool that we're going to talk about, the rule of life that we're going to talk about is, is the, it's the you have to fight and to be over in this corner and to not just get swept up over here, because that is inevitably what will happen if you choose not to fight. If you choose to, to be apathetic about this, you will be here. Make no mistake, this requires a fight. And so here's what I want to do. Um, I want to look at two passages. I want to look at Old Testament for a minute, and then I want to look at New Testament for a minute. And I want to look at people engaged in this fight for formation as the people of God. Um, Pre-Jesus, Post Jesus. Is that cool? And so uh, I, the first passage I want to go to, 
I preached about this passage one year ago, like literally the Sunday after Easter. And, and so I even, uh, full disclosure, right? I'm being transparent this morning. I hit Command C and Command V on my computer and copied my notes from a year ago uh, on some of this stuff uh, that I want to share with you. But we, we covered the book of Daniel. We did five short weeks in the book of Daniel a year ago. And that, that book is remarkable. That series was fun. You can find it in our history on YouTube um, or our website or whatever. And, and it was a great series. But to give you a little bit of context of what's happening at the time, the nation of Babylon has um, taken over the nation of Israel, right? And the Assyrians came through in 722 B.C. And the Assyrians were horrible. They were just, they, they would unspeakable things whenever they beat up on Israel. But when the Babylonians came through, they were a little bit more civil and they, they had more of a game plan rather than just to kill and torture in crazy ways. When the Babylonians came through, their game plan was we are going to take the nation of Israel over. We're going to take Judah. We're going to take Jerusalem. We're going to take it all over. And we are going to exile the people back to the land of Babylon, and if they're dum-dums, they're going to be slaves. If they're, um, if they're a little bit smart, that's what we're going to talk about. If they, if they show to be like the best of the best, that's, that's where we're going in our passage today, okay? So, so that's exactly what happened. So, so Nebuchadnezzar, he, he, he does this, and so Daniel, the author of the book of Daniel, finds himself in this elite status, and the preparation for what we're going to talk about is he's being prepared to be Dare I say it in church? Dare I say it? We're going to call it deformation. He's being brainwashed. <laughs> okay? And, and, and so this is their attempt at brain, Babylonian brainwash in here. And so we're going to be in Daniel chapter 1 as we pick up um, this, this story this morning. Let's see if I can get there with the microphone in my hand. And it says this. Daniel chapter 1 says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. And then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. And he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. So they take the best of the best. They take the, the royal family, and they get this guy Ashpenaz, and, and, and his job is to say, okay, here was your life. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those five books are what is historically known as the Torah and would have been their literature, would have been their formation, would have been their life, would have been what they staked everything on and, and, and how they were being formed into the image of God. And Ashpenaz is like, okay, guys, I know that... This is a part of your formation, but we are going to take that away and we are going to introduce to you our literature, our philosophies, our perspectives, our worldview. And we're going to do this for the next three years. We're going to do this very thing. Help but think, okay? And I shared this a year ago, but I can't help but the irony. Seven, right? And, and I was I was doing some reading yesterday and everything, and I guess the world's going to change in, in in some big ways with AI. Thing, but in two yet, and we don't know exactly yet. But we do know in two thousand seven there was a huge shift, right? In in international culture, let's just say, because in two thousand seven, and I was an early adopter. This thing came out. Right? Anybody remember? I remember being like, everybody was really skeptical, and I was like, I gotta have one. <laughs> I gotta have me one of those. And I don't know if I got one in late 2007 or 2008, but I had my, I've had an iPhone since that day. I tried to give up on it for three months whenever we first. 
I went through with drugs and had to go out and get one. <laughs> Full transparency. <laughs> but I wonder sometimes if for you and I, we're more accustomed to the literature of the day than the literature of God. Right? Going back to the illustration of the fight of your life, this, this is hard. This is hard. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but when I wake up in the morning and it's early and I, I went to Bible college, <laughs> right? And, and, and opening this is hard. Having a plan to read this and to have it help form my life. You know what's easy? Do you know what's really easy? This. To make myself a little cup of coffee. It's getting too close to home. All of a sudden, we're like looking at what other people are doing, how other people have designed their backsplash. People are eating and doing and whatever. And, 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 and we're looking at the news articles from our perspective based on whatever political bend we have. And we're like looking at it and we're like, do, 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 do. I'm Easy. I'm getting shaped over here. I'm getting in the South San Diego. Not to say that's all bad. I'm, I'm saying, but you get it. And then God's saying, man, this is the fight of your life. This is the fight of your life. If you want to be formed, it's going to be hard. It's going to require some work. And it's not easy. Food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. So, um, I won't go, I won't go too long into this, but another way they tried to deform them was their diet. Like I put a diet in the Old Testament, God in the Old Testament, and um, and so they had, they had very strict diet codes that that marked the people of God at this time. And what the Ashpenaz is doing this this Babylonian ruler is he's saying. Now, don't get me wrong, like, this culture, he's saying, y'all want rib pie? <laughs> you want some surf and turf? You want a cheeseburger, right? <laughs> you can't have a cheeseburger over here. <laughs> like, you want to put cheese on that meat? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> you want to you have some of the best wine? And forget about that bottom shelf liquor. You want to have some of the top shelf liquor? I mean, we're talking about the, the, the high dollar stuff. You, you want that? You want, you want to party every day over here? And, and, and you want to do that for three years? Formed in this way with your life, but I'm trying to take you this way. With your nation, with your brain, with your acculturation, with your, you're being swept up into our culture over here. And I love, I love, I love, I love what Daniel says, we don't have a chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And see that word resolved, it, it conjures up this image of I am driving a stake in the ground. Meaning what we see a couple chapters later is that King, well, we, what we see is that they, the, chief, the chief guy, the chief royal guy is like, I, I like these guys, I'll listen to Daniel's request. And so it's like, hey, put me to the test. Give me 10 days to eat my people. And, and what we see all throughout the Old Testament was that 10 was the test. There was the 10 commandments. Eggs. God had commanded 10 of their income and a tithe. And, and every time God had given them and, and, and to put God or their trust in God. So when we see this, Daniel says, and at the end of these 10 days, they're blown. Daniel's better looking. He's smarter. He's, he's just 10 times better than the other people as a result of following God's plan. And so fast forward to, to it's like, okay, we're going to, if you're going to get thrown into a fire furnace, if you don't bow down to this big idol culture worships, but to worship in God alone. He puts his stake in the ground and he does that. And so we see this beautiful example. Um, there's some similarities what we see. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appeared to over 500 people gathered together, and all of a men gets up to these people, and, and they speak up, and they say, we believe your message 
now what do we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every single one of you. And 3,000 people that we see from the scriptures, Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people put their faith, put their trust, put their belief in this person of Jesus. And this, guys, the thing I'm trying to say is that this is just as controversial for them as it was for Daniel. Like, we always romanticize these stories like they're like us in 2024. And we like literally have a tax law change and we cry persecution. <laughs> we get made fun of a little bit, right? <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, like, we're talking fiery furnaces over here in the Old Testament. For the, it's like, like, you know, did not disrupt the Roman Empire. The Jewish traditions as they were. <laughs> They didn't. They found a way to play nicely together. <laughs> right? The Roman Empire ruled the world and they let the Jews do what they wanted to do at this time. And in this particular instance, you know who didn't disrupt the apple cart? Jesus. <laughs> and he disrupted. And 3,000 people are like, what do we do? <laughs> And he says, repent and be baptized, every single one of you. And that's where we pick up on this famous verse that if you've been in church, you've heard. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders, at, that the many wonders and performed by the apostles. All the property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their to their number daily those who were saved. The fact that the Lord added to their number daily is crazy. Because, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, this is the life. But it doesn't cost you what it cost them. And sometimes because it doesn't cost you what it cost them, it becomes cheap. And it becomes mundane, routine, and all of a sudden, following Jesus and being formed by Jesus can become or an add-on to our already busy, swept-up current of Southern California culture over here. A few things. Daniel, they devoted themselves to the diet, literature, prayer, and worship of God. In Acts, they devoted themselves to the teaching, communion, and prayer. And what I want to talk about for a couple minutes is this weapon that you have for the fight of your life. And what I want to talk about is it's, it's this thing called a rule of life. And for centuries, we've kind of gotten away from it because we've um, made church so corporate in so many ways. And we've made this, this one hour thing. You know, I'm, here I am. I'm feeding into it. And that's fine. i got to use some aspects of it to talk about it. But this one hour that you come to and, and we become consumers of this one hour and everything. But for centuries, people followed the way of Jesus, they, they put this thing called a rule of life. And I put it in your note sheet, it's this. A rule of life is a set of habits or rhythms to help pattern your life in the way of Jesus. Okay? And, and I want to talk about this for a, a, a couple minutes. Um, and, and I don't want to give you, like, this recipe for your life. Um, because that's going to be between you and Jesus and your hang-ups, your habits, and how much you've been swept up into Southern California culture. Okay? And so I don't want to, but I want to, what I do want to point you to is some add ons, some extra credit, some reading that you could do, because these are three books that have very much shaped um, the way that I'm talking about these scriptures and the way that I'm um, talking about the Bible and the Bible in general within Southern California culture right now. So the first one is this, and I, I really, 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 really love this book. Um, it's called The Common Rule by Justin Whitmull Early, The Common Rule. Okay, and this, this book is, oh gosh, it's so foundational um, to talking about establishing a rule of life and establishing habits and, and patterns towards your life after Jesus. Um, and the thing that I love so much about the book and the next one I'm going to talk about is the guy isn't a pastor. He's an acquisitions and merger lawyer, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and it's just 
so profound and great for me as a pastor to read his work and to hear him talk about how he will, you know, get on his knees in the morning and pray for his day in formation in, in the eyes of God and, and how, you know, through three or four cups of coffee and through meetings from the morning, his whole day is blown to bits and all of a sudden he's at lunch and he has to lock his door, get down on his knees and pray while he's in this fight of his life that God would continue to take over his day and that he would not get just swept up by everybody else's agenda was for him, whatever the culture's agenda is for him. And I love that. Early. Kids at home or if you have kids at home. They don't have to be super young. Habits of the household, oh my gosh. Justin Whitmore early. Um, in this, he's going to talk about disciplining your kids. He's going to talk about screen time for your kids. He's going to talk about um, uh, just eating around the table and how all of these things. I, and I actually love the chapters where he talks about playing with your kids, working with your kids, doing different things with your kids, and rhythms and practices that help us live out the gospel in the context of our families and to be formed by everything around us. Habits of the Household, phenomenal, phenomenal book um, when it comes to these. And then last but not least, this is actually written by a pastor, but Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about this book next week because of what we're intending out of our rule of life um, when it comes to this. But he talks a lot about formation in this age um, in our life. And the thing that I guess I would that wind this message down with that one of the things that he continually talks about is how as a culture we've kind of gotten away from looking to Jesus as an example and he said it, it, you know he kind of one of the things he kind of talks about like when when was it that we got away from looking to Jesus as the picture of human flourishment right and 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 nowadays, in our culture, church went in 2000. Look at Jesus. A get out of hell ticket. <laughs> we look at Jesus as a get into heaven ticket. I don't know whether you're doom and gloom or glass is half empty, glass is half full. You know, that's how it is, right? But we, we look at Jesus as the person who paid the penalty on the cross, and we look at the story, the crucifixion, and the resurrection, and all this stuff. But one of the things that he argues is that Jesus lived 33 years on his planet and we would do ourselves a favor to look at how he lived as an example for how we should live and how we could live that may be the example of what human flourishment is like, right? That if we look to his rhythms, look to his practices, look to the way that he lived his life, what if there's something to be said about the way that he lived his life that isn't chronic anxiety, chronic depression, that we carry over here in the culture that we get swept up in. And we're to look over here and be like, man, I want to model my life after Jesus and maybe I will get the peace, the patience, the joy, the perspective, the fulfillment, and the different aspects of Jesus. Like he was a centered person. You know what Jesus wasn't doing? He wasn't having mid-Christmas mild anxiety attacks. You know? Because he knew his purpose. And he knew what to do. And, and I think that so often tells me better how I should live. My phone tells me better of what I should aim for. My phone tells me better of what I should do this. And, and we're like, man, when did we get away from looking to Jesus as the picture of human flourishment? and what it means to flourish in our society. See, Ben, you guys can go ahead and, and come on up here because I want to leave you with an image today um, as we kind of close this off. I, I've always debated whether to tell this story. I know I've told it before in Church 180, but I've always debated just because, I don't know, just it's weird, Christian culture, whole thing. But in 2011, um, Kelsey and I had the vineyard, or it's right there. 2011, uh, um, one of Kelsey's best friends from high school married a guy from Adelaide, Australia. And the wedding was going to be there. And they flew us over so that Kelsey could be in the wedding and so that I could perform the wedding, which was my first wedding at the time. And it was at a little boutique winery um, in the Barossa Valley. I don't know if you've heard of the Barossa Valley. It's my favorite valley in Australia. 
probably in the world now when it comes to good wine. And before I went on that trip, I didn't, I didn't you know, I didn't know wine at all. <laughs> and uh, I had no clue. And so we go on this trip, and it's at this little boutique winery that was absolutely phenomenal. And for the next few days, we traveled all over the Barossa with them. And, um, wineries, and I, I walked out of that trip a wine snob. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, tell me about the year. Did it, how many hours of, you know what I mean? And I walk out of this trip like, like, and, and, and you can't just plant a grapevine in the ground, right? You can't just plant a grapevine in the ground and like let it sit because it will continue to grow, but it will grow it will grow and it will become a mess. It will grow and it will get all tangled up and choke itself out. And it won't receive the right amount of sunlight. It doesn't matter how much sun you get. It won't receive the right amount of nourishment from the rain. It just will be a sucky plant, <laughs> you know. It will be a crap bottle of wine that you have to put a lot of sugar in. <laughs> Tastes bad. But what, what they do is they build these structures called trellises with which the grapevine can travel up and it can be a support and it can be a structure and it can be a thing that helps this plant get maximum sun, maximum elements, and it's in a position to be formed correctly. And so what I'm going to say, I'm not going to leave you with, um, I'm not going to leave you with a, a to-do list few weeks, okay? We're going to talk about what it means because your rule of life is not going to be the same as my rule of life, okay? The, 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 way, the habits and the rhythms and the practices that you use are not going to be the same as mine because you have a different experience, you have different hang-ups, you have different problems, you have different struggles, you have different anxieties, and there are different things going on in your life. And one of the things that Comer is going to talk about is there's different things for each person that are their trellis, Right? If, if, you know, if you have addictions or whatever that's going on in your life, one of the things he's going to talk about is that you might, within your trellis might be the, the, for, the, the formation tool of fasting. And that as you fast or as you give up food for like a Wednesday or a Thursday or whatever, that as you do that, that you're strengthening those muscles to fight and to be formed by God, not by the world. That you're strengthening those muscles. So I don't know what it is that you're going to need in your toolbox, but the thing that I'm going to a trellis, you don't have to stand a chance. Without a trellis, you don't have a weapon. Without a weapon, you are going to get swept into whatever this culture wants you to become. Let's call it the algorithm. <laughs> you get swept up in the algorithm. And so what I want to leave you with today is just the fact that you need a trellis. And you can start to do some homework. You can go to practicingtheway.org. It's on your note sheet. And you can start to build your own rule based on your life experiences, but the thing I want to leave you with is just that you're trustless because you're not static and you are being formed. See, one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that we at Church 180 believe as a, as a rule of life and as a trellis that we incorporate each is the act of communion. And do that they devoted themselves to teaching, fellowship, prayer and and just remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for the forgiveness and the hope that we have and so on each table in the back there's some juice that represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled out there's a cracker that represents the body of Jesus that was broken and we do that to remember because we think that there's something about that we believe there's something about that that centers us and grounds us and is a trellis for our life and our formation as we go forth from here so i'm gonna pray for that time and then you're free anytime during this song to go grab that and to take communion with us jesus thank you um may we be in for the of our life may we be the victory and squeeze the ours because we're victor we thank you for that Thank you.